When it comes to New South Wales, there is a long history of politicians using public money as though it is their private plaything, and particularly the government of the day, treating public money as a tool for their re-election campaign. The Premier has made an extraordinary admission revealing she believes political pork barrelling is OK. The term pork barrelling is, is common parlance, and if that's the accusation made on this occasion, I'm happy to accept that commentary. In 2016, the New South Wales government had a forced amalgamations policy for councils. It caused a huge amount of political damage to the government, but it also caused a lot of economic damage to those councils who were forcibly amalgamated and who resisted amalgamation. The government's response to that was to roll out a $250 million grants program called the Stronger Communities Grants Program. We first found out about this from active citizens on the ground who had seen a series of grants projects being rolled out and had no idea where the money came from. We began to ask questions and we could find no answers on the public record. Eventually, we forced the release of a series of documents that showed where the money came from and importantly, for the first time ever, the scale of this fund. That's when we found out it was a $250 million grant scheme that had been delivered overwhelmingly to coalition councils. 95% of the $252 million went to coalition held seats. The most extreme case was the better part of $100 million that was handed out to just one coalition dominated council, Hornsby Council. Literally, the general manager from Hornsby Council received a phone call from the Office of Local Government along the lines of, we have $100 million for you, would you like $100 million? To which the uh, CEO said, yes, what do I need to do? What application do I need to do? Don't you worry about that, he was told. We've got all the paperwork, we'll get it to you. And literally within 72 hours of that phone call, the council had $100 million in its bank account. How did that happen? Well, it turns out that the core approval for that came from the office of Gladys Berejiklian. All those arrangements went through the normal processes. I don't intervene in those processes. We asked in the course of the inquiry for all of the documents and we were told that there were no documents. We didn't believe that. We called senior staff from the Premier's office and it turns out in questioning that the document that had gone before the Premier had been shredded. Not only had that document been shredded, but all digital copies had been deleted as well. We eventually forced the recovery of the electronic document through a forensic document recovery process, and it turns out that it was literally the handing over of $100 million to deliver a political outcome for the Coalition. We then roll on to the bushfire grants. We had communities across the state suffering badly. There was a desperate need for recovery grants. Again, we saw, in this case, a scheme that was jointly managed by the state and the federal government, rolling out urgent bushfire assistance grants, but delivering them again on a deeply partisan basis. Two major coalition donors, Pratt Industries and Borrell, received tens of millions of dollars. Yet not a single grant was approved for places like the Blue Mountains, which had been savaged by the fires. Places like the Central Coast, they didn't get a single dollar. Yet coalition-held seats around the state were showered with funds. Premier, you requested a reassessment of a $5.5 million grant that Daryl McGuire stood to gain a political Can benefit you please from. stand back a bit? Thank you. But what has happened in relation to this current ICAC hearing? What we do know is that one of those key grants is a five and a half million dollar grant for a conference centre at a gun club on the outskirts of Wagga Wagga. It was a five and a half million dollar grant approved in principle by the New South Wales government in 2016 and then approved in practice and the money delivered in 2017. You made decisions that would benefit your boyfriend. Wrong. That's the truth. One of the troubling elements was the grant was always being pushed in New South Wales government by Daryl Maguire. You're not answering I'll, the question. The You're problem. trying to avoid this, this, answering this the question me. here. And it turns out, again through the work of ICAC, that we now know that Daryl Maguire was secretly seeking a commission, the payment of thousands of dollars, for the delivery of furniture and furnishings to that facility when it was eventually built. An obvious and direct conflict of interest in his role as an MP in advocating for the project and his own personal interests in the project. We then used the powers of the New South Wales Upper House to compel the production of all of the key documents. We discovered through those documents that the initial business case assessment said that it was a stinker, that it should never go ahead. As it turns out, a conference centre at a gun club on the outskirts of Wagga Wagga doesn't draw international tourists, doesn't draw interstate tourists, and it's not a viable project. That's what the initial business case said. But this was never about the merits. Documents that we forced the production of showed that the Premier's office itself sought a review of the business case. 
And we also saw documents from government agencies saying that they knew it was important to the Premier and wanting to keep her in the loop. Mr Maguire was a colleague of 15 years. He was someone that I trusted and that developed into a close personal relationship. There was no functional role for the Premier in the assessment of this grant. We have sought from the government an explanation for that. We have sought from the government details about whether a conflict of interest was ever on the record. Isn't that a serious conflict of interest given you were in a secret relationship with him at the time? Firstly, the, the proposition you're putting is absolutely ridiculous. And second, all proper processes were followed and that's all I say on the matter. There are many people in the community who have criticised the timing of ICAC's hearings. If an independent commission against corruption withheld an anti-corruption inquiry because of its own assessment of where the politics of the day were at, that would fundamentally undermine its independence. The fact that ICAC is proceeding with its investigation now is confirmation that it's independent of politics. And I remind people that while ICAC is opening these investigations in relation to the current coalition government, at the same time, there are open criminal proceedings against former Labor Party ministers for alleged corruption that they had in their time at office that only came about through independent investigations by ICAC. ICAC has shown itself to be independent of politics of the day. Politicians from the major parties don't like that. Scott Morrison doesn't want an ICAC on his case at a federal level. If you want to create political change, it's not going to be magically delivered from within inside of parliaments. Parliaments need to be forced to act. Politicians need to be forced to act. And that is why documentary filmmakers, investigative journalists have always got to be part of this. Bringing together the different strands of a story to tell a compelling story and persuade people that we can change politics and we can change politics for the better. That's why film festivals like the Dare to Struggle Film Festival are essential. Bringing together those storytellers who can persuade the public and inform the public at the same time. It is by multiple actors working together that we get political change. It's by parliaments being forced by the media, independent investigative journalists, people outside of parliament, the voting public. That's how we get change.